Well, this is part 31 of our series, Thou Preparest a Table Before Me, Wild Harvest Edibles. And just as a reminder, as we talk about these things, that uh, if you have any kind of a health challenge or issue that you're navigating, just make sure you partner with a medical practitioner that shares a similar philosophy of care for the human body and disease and in health that you do. Um, and that the things we talk about here are for educational purposes and can be added to your wellness toolbox. If you choose to implement them, just be sure you do your own due diligence and research around them and make sure that they are something that you are comfortable uh, participating in. <clears throat> Don't just blind accept it, blindly accept anything without doing your due diligence. The doctor of the future will give no medicine, according to Thomas Edison, but will instruct his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet and the cause and prevention of disease. Uh, <clears throat> That seems like we were getting closer to that in, uh, in the uh, recent past. And it seems like now we're getting almost even farther and farther away from that notion in some circles. <clears throat> but he was a, a forward thinking person in this, in this concept. <clears throat> so tonight, we're gonna be actually looking at another fungus. Last time we looked at usnea, which is a symbiotic relationship between uh, an algae and a fungus. Uh, called a lichen. So usnea had some amazing properties associated with it. Tonight we're going to be looking at a fungi uh, in its own right. So Chamides versicolor. It's also known as Coriolis versicolor. So Coriolis, there's something known as the Coriolis effect, which when you have water going down a drain, it tends to spin in a particular direction. And if you look at these pictures of the, the mushroom here, <clears throat> it kind of looks like a spinning funnel going down a drain perhaps. And so that could be where that, that term comes from. So it actually has a long history of use in Japan and China in traditional Japanese and Chinese medicine. In China, it's referred to as yunsi, and it's often used in combination with cancer treatments and complements both chemo and radiation therapies and can also be used independently of either one. It's actually grown, it can grow all across the world. So there's some other plants that have that distinction as well. I remember visiting, visiting uh, Japan, actually it was Korea, visiting Korea and finding Douglas fir tree there, fir trees there. And I felt right at home with Douglas fir trees all around in the high country and even right along the coast, just like we have here. It is the uh, Western Pacific. So it's interesting that they have Douglas fir there. Uh, we also have things like bracken fern, which are that grow all across the globe in the right environment. So there are plants that you can find universally. Dandelion is also one that is almost universally found across the world in various places. <clears throat> so to identify turkey tail, it typically grows in colonies on, on tree stumps and fallen logs. You can see it here. It's a kind of a shelf type of fungi, although it doesn't have the same three-dimensional figure that you see in something like an artist conch or a reishi mushroom, which are very, very thick. So it's not a conch per se, but it is a shelf fungi appearing fungus. It has multicolored concentric bands and they can be black, brown, tan, gray, blue, red, orange, white. So there's a whole variety, almost a rainbow of colors that can be seen. And they present in different ways. Probably has something to do with their environment and then the type of nutrients that they get um, from their decaying matter that they're living off of. So the edges have wavy ripples like a turkey tail and they're, they're thin, so they don't have, they're not thick. It's almost, almost paper-like, like thick paper, but it doesn't get like a thick, several inch thick pad like you see on some types of shelf fungi. So you can find them up to four inches across, but they can are typically more often found up to two inches in size. So they don't have stems. Uh, the cap can be velvety, uh, fuzzy and thin and flexible. <clears throat> so again, it's not thick and stiff <clears throat> like you would see in other types of shelf fungi. It, if you look at the underside, you can see the lower quadrant on the right picture as the underside of the, of the shelf fungi, of the turkey tail. And those are the pores from which the sori, the spores would, would come forth. It doesn't have gills. So it's not a mushroom per se. Uh, the growing or leading edge is going to be white or nearly so. And as it advances and ages and moves back through the, 
through the fungus as it, as it grows, it changes color and takes on the, the banding pattern that you see. So whenever we're talking about fungi, there's always a warning associated with that. You wanna make sure that you have a positive identification of the fungi that you are anticipating consuming. Uh, Cause there can be some significant effects, uh, illness or death potentially if you eat the wrong kinds of fungi. So you wanna be really, really sure, uh, consult with someone who knows, <clears throat> use very positive identification when you're gonna be consuming a, a fungus. But that being said, the turkey tail is a fairly readily identifiable uh, type of shelf fungi that you would, you would locate or find. <clears throat> From an edibility standpoint, it's very, very nutritious. Uh, has lots of different vitamins and minerals associated with it, probably coming from its breakdown process of the decaying uh, wood matter that it's growing on. The, uh, the uh, downside is it has very low pal palatability and its digestibility is on the low side. So it's not something you would be eating in quantity like other types of, of mushrooms that people sometimes use like portobello or something like that. It's not often eaten as a food, <clears throat> uh, but more often used medicinally. So here's the turkey tail's namesake. So here's a, a tom turkey with its uh, tail all out in a fan. And you can see the resemblance in the turkey tail mushroom to that concentric pattern formation on the tail of the turkey. So in the International uh, Medicinal Mushrooms Journal, there was an interesting article on the assessment of bioactive compounds and antioxidant activity of turkey tail medicinal mushroom, Trimedes versicolor. And uh, that was published in 2020. And uh, some of the different compounds that were found there were p-hydroxybenzoic, uh, protocachuic, vanillic, homogenesis acids. Uh, and then we have some amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, methionine, tyrosine, glutamine, and asparagine. And then also a, a number of other compounds, nicotinic acid, nicotinamide, not to be confused with nicotine. So there isn't nicotine in it but linoleic and linolenic acid. So both of those are, are omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids, palmitic acid and stearic acid. So that's, that's an interesting kind of uh, nutrient profile that is, is pre present in the turkey tail mushroom. So the medicinal properties are quite varied. It can actually be used on a daily basis <clears throat> in its tincture form. If you're gonna be using a, a tincture internally, you'll want to use that in a, in a uh, vegetable glycerin kind of, of preparation as opposed to an alcohol uh, preparation. For external use, alcohol uh, should be fine. So the dry or powdered uh, turkey tail can be used in a capsule form, and it can also be used as turkey tail tea. So you would take the dried or powdered turkey tail and do a, do a water extraction in a tea form. So those are the three primary ways that turkey tail is used in a medicinal fashion as a tincture, dried and powdered in capsules or in a tea. The tincture is usually uh, arrived at through a double extraction process that we'll look at here shortly. Looking at the immune system, it has benefits that aid both flu and cold situation. So we know that flus and colds are both uh, viral sourced. So it's an excellent antiviral in that respect. It also has lots of antioxidants associated with it and anti-inflammatory components that help to regulate the immune system. So we know that the underlying basis of all disease is actually inflammatory processes and this can help mitigate that the turkey tail. So in doing a double extraction process, so we have a, a jar over here on the right that has a, an extraction in process here. So you can scale the ingredients to whatever ratio you have available. And this is true for lichen and for mushroom extractions. So take eight plus ounces of the turkey tail uh, using the um, 80 to 100 proof alcohol for external applications. I recommend the vegetable glycerin for internal applications and uh, 16 ounces of distilled water. So fill your quart canning jar half full of turkey tail. So if you had a smaller size, it'd just be half full of whatever size you have. So you can just adjust those ratios to the amount and quantity that you might have on hand. So fill it to half inch of the top with the glycerin if it's used internally, uh, stir it and cap it. Shake it every few days for two months, then strain off the, the fluid, 
and keep that and discard the extracted turkey tail. So you could just put that into, uh, just sift it through a, a colander or a uh, screened mesh sifter or cheesecloth would be fine too. So you set that aside. Then you make a decoction of the fresh fungi, uh, 16 ounces of water in a ceramic or glass pot. So using ceramic or glass, just so it's non-reactive, as opposed to metals that could be reactive, <clears throat> put that turkey tail in and then cover it and simmer on low until you've reduced the water to half. If the water reduces too rapidly through the boiling process, just add more water. You just want it to stay, take several hours because it's, a, it's the time as well as the reduction in fluid. The reduction in fluid concentrates the medicinal properties that are extracted and the time is what is needed in order to extract those properties. So in the end, you'll end up with eight ounces of, of decoction. So decoction again is a fluid that has taken on the medicinal or therapeutic properties of whatever substance has been put in it. It's a longer extraction process than an infusion, which is just a, basically a tea. Uh, and tea typically, remember, is much finer particles. So the extraction process will be more rapid in something that is more finely powdered because the surface area will be much greater. Something that has the larger surface area decoction is a, uh, a better way to extract the medicinal qualities over a longer period of time. <clears throat> So don't boil it. You don't want to bring it up to a boiling temperature, just simmer it. So cool the water and then strain it and then add um, to the, the previous tincture above, whether it's alcohol or glycerin, depending on the approach you took with it. And then the results in a 30% alcohol shelf stable uh, uh, product when stored and sealed, unless you're using glycerin, of course. So the ratio of tincture, whether it's glycerin or alcohol to water should be a uh, three to one from the, the mushroom tincture to water. <clears throat> so it'll be diluted, diluted a little bit, but mostly it's gonna be the extracted and beneficial therapeutic portion of the uh, tincture. So it does have some cancer benefiting qualities. It, has reports of being able to kill cancer cells and tumor. It helps to support the immune system during chemotherapy. Chemotherapy essentially functions to irradiate or kill uh, the tissues that are not responding to the program cell death or apoptosis signals that are normally present in properly functioning cells. Uh, but it fights cancer and not only fights it, but it protects the body through immune modulation from secondary infections that can come in in an immune compromise, compromise situation. So the, the radiation, the chemotherapy, the, the, um, the drugs that are being taken can lower the immune system and this helps uh, prevent an infection from taking over as a result. It also tends to help prevent spread or metastasis of cancer throughout the body. So some key therapeutic properties include polysaccharide K, PSK. So polysaccharide just means it's the many chained sugar. So polysaccharide K, crestin, and polysaccharopeptide. So a peptide is a subunit of a protein. So it's like an amino acid, another name for an amino acid is a peptide. So it's a polysaccharopeptide. Basically it's a, a, an amino acid with many sugars attached to it. And it could be different combinations of sugars because uh, there are uh, single subunit sugars known as monosaccharides that are hooked in multiple combinations. In the human body, there are eight of those monosaccharides that are significant to human physiology, and they would be attached in different combinations to make a unique polysaccharopeptide. So PSK, that is the polysaccharide K, has been used clinically in Japan since the 70s uh, in correlation with traditional cancer therapies. So there's been a lot of study, a lot of literature that supports the use of turkey tail in cancer. So that being said, it's also beneficial in HPV, human papilloma, papilloma virus. And the cervical dysplasia is a, a, an outgrowth of having that infection. And herpes has a variety of different presentations. Shingles is the infection with chickenpox of a nerve tract in the body, typically uh, being quite painful and staying in line with that nerve tract as the infection progresses. Um, so the turkey tail has effects against bacteria 
and, and viruses. So these, these uh, particular um, components here that we're talking about are all viral based um, and also helps to fight the secondary infections. That's where the bacteria comes in <clears throat> with the secondary infection. So it's seen that uh, with viral challenges in general that reishi mushroom along with the, uh, the turkey tail has very good therapeutic benefit particularly for herpes, shingles, and HPV. <clears throat> Turkey tail can be beneficial for digestion. Uh, one of the things that it aids is providing vitamins and minerals that support healthy gut microbiome. So basically supporting the bacteria that are in the gut. And we know that the, the microbiome is a large proportion of what drives our immune system and help, helps it be regular uh, <clears throat> and regulated appropriately. If our gut microbiome has been disrupted by antibiotic or by some other means, that can leave us in a compromised health situation. So in that regard, it helps with leaky gut uh, by performing prebiotic roles and basically helping to keep that gut microbiome thriving. So the digestive complaints of various types respond well to the inclusion of turkey tail in, in the diet. And that diet wouldn't be necessarily a culinary aspect, but more of a supplemental aspect. We talked about using that either as, a, as a, a powdered capsule or as a tea or as a tincture. Also has some preventative roles uh, within the, the realm of some pretty heavy duty uh, viral situations, uh, HIV and AIDS and Kaposi's sarcoma. Kaposi's sarcoma is a common skin cancer that AIDS sufferers encounter. It's been, <clears throat> been designated in that regard and it, uh, the Turkey tail stimulates interferon production and helps to inhibit the, the binding of HIV to the lymphocytes, which are the white blood cells that are the main uh, circulatory product that fight infection. <clears throat> so the HIV AIDS mechanism essentially is by depleting the lymphocytes by, by killing them out and leaving the body defenseless. So it's very well researched, the ability to improve the immune system's strength and capacity and helps the patients to fight off diseases as they're moving through uh, the HIV infection. So diabetes, uh, turkey tail helps aid in lowering glucose levels in diabetics. And this could be the mechanism of helping it fight cancer by, be, by depriving the tumor area, the cancer cells of excess sugar. Excess sugar is one thing that cancer cells thrive on. So it also aids in blood sugar level management. We've seen several things over the course of our time together. Another one that we are remembering off the top of my head that is helpful in that regard is berries. So using, using whole berries as well as uh, devil's club. And there are some others in addition to that, but turkey tail could be helpful for helping to manage diabetes when other readily available medications that are traditionally used today are not available. So it has a, a variety of anti-inflammatory roles. So most modern disease situations are derived from inflammation and they can be from acute to severe to chronic. Uh, and the turkey tail helps to reduce internal inflammation. <clears throat> it can be used internally and applied to the skin. So for the skin, things like rashes, swelling, joint swelling, you can just apply it to the skin. We use a, use a oil, extraction, you could put it into a salve and add it to some beeswax for it to uh, be spread on the skin more easily. It also helps to uh, inhibit the, the growth of candida. So candida can be a very debilitating yeast infection when it overgrows, so it can help to mitigate that. Very interesting that it has anti-malarial effects. So it also not only just in general, but there is a, a chloroquine resistant plasmodium strain, which is the, the effective agent that the mosquito carries. And so the mosquito is the vector that carries that uh, effective agent and causes the uh, malaria by infecting the, the red blood cells of the host. <clears throat> also helpful in chronic fatigue syndrome. So very helpful in, in helping to fight chronic fatigue syndrome. And it's uh, very likely tied to its antiviral activity, which can interrupt what's been implicated as the virus that is key in initiating and prolonging the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. It's from the XMRV family of viruses, xenotropic marine-like retroviruses, which have been uh, 
which have been noted as being the one of the primary agents to underlying chronic fatigue syndrome. Also can help support a healthy heart by assisting in lowering low density lipoprotein, the, the bad cholesterol, only because it doesn't carry as much cholesterol out of the body. Um, it also reduces hypertension and high blood pressure. So taking it on a daily basis can help maintain a, a healthful blood pressure. And basically reducing these two factors can help uh, reduce heart disease uh, risk. So if you did those two, just using turkey tail on a regular basis, there's no mention here of of diet, but we know that diet in and of itself is a very powerful mitigator of those very same things. The low density lipoprotein and hypertension can both be greatly affected by a whole foods plant-based diet. <clears throat> so some tips for harvesting the turkey tail, choose mushrooms with, their, with clean white underside sur surfaces with uh, nice pores. So you can see that in the lower right quadrant picture of the four group of four there. Uh, and remove the fungi, uh, attachment point to the tree. So you want to just cut off the point at which it attached to the tree itself uh, before you would use the rest of the fungus for, um, for the therapeutic use. And then also like any plant that you would use for food or medicine, you want to make sure it's in a, from a place that's environmentally clean, environmentally clean, no toxins or um, hazards associated with where you would have collected it from. So just a reminder that while turkey tail is considered a completely safe uh, fungal form to use both medicinally and edible, uh, always confirm the identification before you would consume it. Because if you make a mistake, it's hard to turn it around. Um, if you happen to eat a mushroom or fungus that happens to be toxic. So just always make sure that you're functioning under a positive ID scenario.